Right, we're going to have a panel discussion now. Um, I've invited four experienced cruising sailors to come and present themselves in front of you. Um, I'm going to ask them questions to try and pull out their knowledge and experience, keep the conversation running. Um, do feel free to engage with them and ask questions. Um, just wave your hand so I, where I'm talking, I don't always see people in the audience, so um, try and attract my attention. Um, I've called this session Tips for the Cruising Life. Um, it's how to turn your blue water dream into reality. So I'm going to kind of cover things like budgets and uh, crew and setting, if you like, the organising the cruising life. Um, I'm trying not to focus on gear and equipment. We'll cover that a little bit tomorrow. So if you've got questions uh, you'd like to ask the panel, please do. If not, uh, sit there and enjoy, and um, we'll keep the conversation going for you, hopefully entertain you along the way. First of all, welcome to our panel. Um, Bernard, if you haven't met him, he's uh, been to a number of these events. He's uh, sailed around the world with his um, Wesley Ocean Lord 41, done the Ark a number of times, cruised in the Mediterranean, um, been a crew guru for, for Sir Che Blyes on, on the Global Challenge, and run a sailing school. So quite a lot going on there for such a young man. Claire, Claire and I go back a long way. Um, Claire is one of these lucky people who can organise her life to go sailing when it suits her mostly. Um, I spoke to Claire about coming down for this weekend. She said, oh, I'm delivering an ocean rowing boat to Plymouth and then I'll pop up. It's, which for most people would be an unusual thing to do, but not for Claire. So she's lucky enough to be able to hop on boats and go places. Um, interesting places like the Pacific or across the Atlantic two or three times on a, a variety of boats. So um, nice to have you along, Claire. Uh, Roger, you will have heard Roger already this morning. Roger's not here as, as a handball instructor. He's here as Roger Seymour, cruising sailor. Um, what I wanted today was not necessarily an official opinion, an official view. I'm trying to drag out from real cruising sailors what works for them. Um, it's not, uh, not so much about what you might read in a book, it's what you actually did on your boats and your experiences, what we're after. And lastly, uh, Mike and also his wife Liz, who are there, uh, they've taken their Harbuck 42 around the world, um, now back in the UK, but uh, done the Ark and a number of other trips, and spent three years, four years? How, how many years doing your, your circumnavigation? Six. Six, oh, a quick one then. Um, so welcome to all of you. Right, um, I've called the first topic voyaging. Um, what I'm trying to get to is some of the sort of knowledge that you have and how you use it on the way across. Um, so I was going to pick up on on, um, on what were your concerns before it cast your mind back to when you might have been sitting in a room like this. Um, Mike, what was the thing that concerned you before you, you set off on your uh, first transocean trip? What, what, what what concerned you the most, and, and did you did you find that you overcame that concern, or that you it wasn't really a problem to worry about? You weren't worrying about the wrong things. Um, difficult going back that far, but I, I think that uh, probably bad weather mm -hmm. was a concern. As how would we cope with really bad weather, um, and what would we do? At what point would we um, decide to? Uh, sort of heave to, or would we run under storm jib? Uh, what's the decision that we want to take? Main down? Do we keep main up? It's really what would we do in those situations? Um, and, and in terms of your six years plus cruising around the world, how often were you sailing when you thought this is bad weather, and how often you were sailing this is lovely weather? What would you, how would you s describe the probability of the weather I you were fearing as opposed to the weather you actually it had? Was a twenty eighty. Type situation. Um, that's 20% um, bad, 80% um, lovely weather, um, generally of that sort of order. And so, did you practice heaving to before you? Did you kind of work we out? Because you were sailing double handed, weren't you? So, we were, yeah. yeah. Yes. yes, we did. Um, and uh, at certain occasions, we um, uh, tried with um, tri sail, we tried to see if we could um, uh, heave to with just tri sail alone. Um, uh, so that we 
we had something that we could do mm -hmm. if the situation arose. Um, we tried it in sort of 25, 30 knots, but if it went higher than that, well, again, we could try it. We had, we had a plan. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have to do it for real then? Um, yes, we did. Mm -hmm. well, no, not with the tri cell as such, but we certainly um, had uh, weather on occasion, certainly across the Indian Ocean in particular, um, and some of the Pacific, in fact, mm -hmm. where we did have to um, uh, reach that decision. Do we take the main down, in which case we wouldn't be able to heave to so easily um, uh, and run under storm jib? Uh, and if it, we were running too fast, then would we want to take that down and put the, the main up again so that we could just um, heave to? Because the, the boat will heave to under just um, main alone. We don't need a head saw up. Um, so there's all those decisions, and we did have to make that sort of decision. Um, and it was fine, um, made the right decision uh, in that particular case. And I think one of the concerns was that um, you think about bad weather, but the fact that is it, it, it can change very quickly, but it doesn't happen very quickly in a sense, that, uh, that you experience wave heights of maybe um, two meters, and then it goes to three meters, and you get used to three meters for a while, and then it goes to three and a half, and then it goes to four. So it doesn't suddenly creep up on no, you and you, jump you, on you. You get used mm -hmm. to it, and after a while, and you've been doing it for a while, it's it's this is what happens. This is the way it is, and it's it's, it's not a big uh, not a big issue. It just make certain that you prepare in advance and uh, in good time. Bernard, we we were talking um, before. Like, take take the mic. Um, you said you learnt an awful lot along the way. The implication of that is you didn't know it before you went, but it didn't matter that you didn't know it before you went. you want to just comment on that a bit? Yeah, surely. Um, I think like most adults, it's better to learn by experiencing it and doing it rather than learning it just by theory. And uh, when you think about it, if you're crossing, let's say, for example, uh, the Atlantic, well, the first thing you've got to do is cross the Bay of Biscay. And you learn an awful lot on that first passage just like for those of you who can remember when you first crossed the channel. It's quite an achievement at the time, but once you've done it, you learned a lot of things about that particular passage, and so it goes on. And then when you get to the Atlantic, you are building on the experience that you've gained, as well as all your theoretical knowledge that you've acquired. And then if you enter the Pacific, and for my crossing, the Pacific was nine months from uh, Panama down into Australia. Well, that's nine months of sailing and nine, nine months of learning. And uh, it's not only when you get bad weather, and you do get, in my case, lots of bad weather. We had an unusual amount of bad weather in different shapes and forms. But also, you have the very quiet periods when you're concerned about how much diesel have I got, because you've got no winds, and all the challenges that brings. Uh, but the first question I think we were asked to answer was, what was our concern? My concern was, um, am I going to have the crew that I need to do the different legs for my different passages? Because uh, whoever you sail with, whether it be your partner or whether it be crew, uh, that's a very important factor. And it's a bit of an unknown until everything lined up. And that in itself, as I heard Jeremy saying earlier, has to be flexible enough to be able to adjust to a different uh, crew situation because of you know weather conditions, someone not turning up, someone being ill, or what have you. Uh, on that final point, this is what can happen. I had a crew person join me in Sri Lanka for the last leg back into the Mediterranean, up the Red Sea and the Suez Canal. And he turned up on the boat, on the aeroplane, uh, with his collarbone on one of these splits. He'd been skiing the week before and broken his collarbone. And I had to explain to him that I was, no, I was not about to cross the Indian Ocean with someone who had got an arm like that in plaster. It was not going uh, so to work. No doubt you did that very tactfully. <laughs> yes. Well, yes, I took him to the airport. <laughs> um, so, so there's those kind of concerns. But at the end of the day, if you set the target date for going, no concern should get in the way of you getting there. And to repeat myself from the beginning, uh, you do learn a great deal when you're on passage. Definitely learning by doing. Um, Claire, obviously everyone in the room is now going to rush out and buy Chris Tibbs's weather book. Um, what advice can you give people about um, 
sources of weather for cruising? You know, where would you point people if they've never done uh, more than maybe sailing around the UK where they're used to listening to the BBC forecast or getting um, information off their phone? Once you're away from that zone, what, what sources and help are there? Okay, um, weather is, along with food, probably second only to food, uh, is a subject that you're going to be really interested in looking at those clouds. Clouds means wind and you really want to be interested in them. So you And you spend all that time looking at those clouds. So after, and I go after my first uh, crossing, I came back very interested in weather but not knowing anything. So I, I took it upon myself to find out about it. And the thing I discovered was, yes, there's Chris Tibbs' book, very good basic weather book. Um, there are a number of others, RYA books and the like, and they're quite basic. Um, and you really, for Atlantic Passage weathers or more, really more in-depth weather, um, but without becoming a meteorologist, there's a sort of gap. So I found um, two, well, uh, several sources. On the internet, there's, there's obviously uh, loads, but one particular is Simon Keeling and weatherweb.net. Um, he does a, um, a daily weather forecast, but it's not just a weather forecast. It's actually explaining about the weather and about the various weather models. And it's only two or three minutes. And they send you an email that you click on every single day. And slowly, over a few weeks and months, you actually do start to understand the patterns of the weather, the weather, weather models, the various sources of weather model. Um, and of course, it turns out that uh, when we're going, um, passage weather got it wrong, or the Met Office had got it wrong, or whatever else, Actually, perhaps not the Met Office is not right, but on the particular, the, the apps you use on your phone, they're actually using the same basic weather model because there's, there's five or six, but all the free apps tend to use the same, same weather model. So actually one of the top tips is actually understand where the forecasts are coming from. If it's a person, they'll be drawing, they'll be drawing on a number of different sources and, and, and adding their personal experience. Um, if it's just an app on your phone, it's probably coming from one big computer in America. Um, so I found that really interesting. Um, and there's, uh, oh, I forget now, I, I have to ask me later. But um, there was a, a, an old book produced in the 1970s by a guy who, um, he was a, an airline pilot and looking at clouds. And within this racing, high performance racing it's called, which frankly I'm not really into high performance racing, but his explanation of clouds and how they work and which way round a cloud you want to go and if you've got not enough wind aim for the gaps because that's going to give you more wind and that was really interesting and particularly once you're crossing an ocean and you can see those clouds it really does work understanding your clouds and whether you want more or less wind and whether you want to be in the front or the side or the back of the clouds it sounds a bit barking when you say it here but it really does help it's a bit harder to do in the Solent I have managed it once, I think, twice maybe, to actually predict where the wind's going to be from looking at the clouds. But there's so many other influences when there's land around. Um, Claire, do you want to just mention Simon Keeling's web address right, again? Yeah. It's uh, weatherweb.net and Simon Keeling. Uh, Roger, moving, the, staying on the subject of, of weather, like, would you like to just kind of give us your view on what the difference is between weather on an ocean and weather on your coastal, how, how, also like coastal sailing versus ocean sailing? How would you sum up the differences? Uh, yeah, it's easy. Coastal sailing is horrendous. <laughs> it's all over the place. We need an app to tell us what's going to happen, don't we? But in the ocean, it's very predictable. Remember, the sources there, as um, Claire was saying, are computer models. So you get an overall picture. But what's coming is coming. You can look in all the textbooks. It says if you look into the distance, you see the clouds coming. They come towards you. They get lower. It's going to rain and the wind's going to blow. It's exactly what happens. It's terrific, isn't it? <laughs> it just sort of happens like that. And then it sort of continues. And if we were talking about bad weather, there's no such thing as bad weather. There's comfortable weather, there's unpleasant weather, and there's weather we avoid. <laughs> but it's that slow, slow process, that build-up. And it's quite, it was correctly said there, by the time it gets to uncomfortable, you're settled down, you're fed, you're experienced, and then it's actually quite exhilarating. If you get beyond that, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> and I've spent an entire lifetime trying to avoid that. 
I think that's the crew. As, as the difference as cruisers, you, you really want to be in the right place at the right time, don't you? I think that's... that's yeah, yeah. Now, just to add that about you're going to take the weather, the really nasty weather in an ocean tends to be very well forecast these days. I mean, the weather forecasting is fantastic. And because it's well forecast, if it's really nasty, then 100 miles is a long way in terms of weather. And you can head south and get out of it um, if, you know, if, it's, if it's nasty. So in some ways, yes, squalls are nasty, but they're short-lived. But big areas of nasty weather, you can generally do something about it. Because in 100, 200 miles, you're, you're taking the sting out of it at the very least. It's interesting, we, we hear about hurricanes on the news, but they tend to hit places that can't move, like Florida. <laughs> um, just moving on from weather then, uh, my other topic I've put up is, is uh, favourite places and routes. So, um, Bernard, do you want to just kind of mull around some of your favourite places and the routes you took to get there? Well, that's Don't a, include Yorkshire, please. The, <laughs> did you mention Yorkshire then? Sorry. <laughs> Lancashire, my goodness. <laughs> I shall talk to you later. <laughs> well, that's a hard one, really, because um, I th for me, it's all about destinations rather than sailing. And there are a lot of people like me, but also there's a lot of people who are not like me who enjoy the sailing, and the destination is almost incidental. Um, so my favourite places tend to be uh, at the end of long passages when I get a terrific sense of achievement. Um, as I say, to cross the Bay of Biscay for the first time uh, is, I think, terrific. And when you arrive in Bayona, or maybe in one case for, for me, La Caruna, and it's fantastic because all of a sudden you've crossed that, you know, big lake, 550 miles or thereabouts, you've faced whatever's been kind of thrown at you, you've overcome it, you've got the fantastic, long memories of that. To sail into Porto Calero, Lanzarote, one of my favourite islands, Lanzarote, it's fantastic. Spend time down there. If you do do the arc, and I hope you do, um, build enough time in to enjoy Spain, Portugal, maybe pop into Gibraltar, a little bit of Morocco. Also, spend time in the Canary Isles. Fabulous sailing ground, great winds, particularly in the afternoon. Um, lovely climate for the pre-arc sailing. The Caribbean, well, I would love to go back to the Caribbean. I'm not quite sure I will now. Uh, but the Caribbean is definitely still one of my very favourite places. And I was fortunate to spend uh, five months sailing in the Caribbean before I had the boat shaped back the first time I went across. Um, and thereafter, well, nine months in the Pacific, I don't want to see another coral island and palm trees ever. <laughs> you know? There's nothing better than plugging in and walking into a restaurant and having a shower in places like Cairns, Australia. Yeah? So, favourite places for me are what you personally are setting out to achieve. For me, it was the destinations after long passages or difficult passages. I've got to say, to come back to weather for a moment, uh, when I crossed the Atlantic for the second time, we went straight into the tropical storm Delta. I don't even remember that one, Jeremy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I was um, just off the Azores in Tropical Storm Delta, and for five, six days, we were in survival mode uh, on a so-called trade wind crossing. Um, but I'll tell you what, my two crew persons that I had with me, uh, when we did get uh, into Antigua on this case, they still dine out on that passage. Not because they crossed the Atlantic, but because they'd ridden through a tropical storm on a small boat called Goldeneye. See what I'm driving at? Mm -hmm. So my favorite places aren't necessarily what is idyllic. It's what do I feel really good about having been Yeah, And there are so many. You will never, ever achieve all the things you want to do with, with um, lovely, fascinating places because there's not enough time in our lives to visit all these lovely places. Even though you may go around the world, you may spend time in the Indian Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, of course you've got the Canaries. There are too many places, Jeremy, I would say, to say, well, oh, you must go and do this, you must go and do that. Mike, what's your, uh, your Liz's take on, on favorite places or, or 
times to be there. Yeah. Just one thing, going back to um, the sea state and, uh, and oceans and things, uh, uh, interested in what other people think, but we found that um, sailing in the Atlantic, um, that the winds and seas tended to be in the same direction. Um, we might have just been lucky, I don't know. Um, but that was very much the case um, going across the Atlantic. And um, when we actually got um, to South Africa, coming up from South Africa, it was, it was big seas, tall seas, but everything was going in the same direction, which was great. Um, the other oceans, lots of cross seas, um, and um, which made the sailing um, a lot more um, uncomfortable at, at times. The, 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 the boats, you, you'd hit a cross sea and you would certainly end up rolling or, or corkscrewing, as I sort of call it. Um, so the Atlantic, I found, or we found, was certainly a lovely ocean to get back to. And I don't know whether that's the same that the, the others have found. Anyway, going on to your, your other question, crikey, um, are, are we talking about through uh, across the world, or are we just, yeah? Um, uh, I would have, well, from the sailing point of view, I've just said, the, the Atlantic, we certainly enjoyed the sailing there much better than, than elsewhere. Um, I think the um, uh, New Zealand, when we got there, the, that feeling of getting to New Zealand, Liz had always wanted to go to New Zealand since she was a little girl. Um, we never thought we'd ever actually sail there. Um, and um, to get there was a huge sense of a satisfaction. And it was a lovely place. Uh, a lot of lovely sailing around the Bay of Islands. Um, got to get a bit more hairy if you go down to the Southern Island, the South Island, but um, certainly I would say New Zealand. Um, I think the uh, Pacific, uh, the, the remoteness of it, um, we loved um, the fact that you'd go to places um, and um, uh, it really was incredibly remote. Um, people would um, be keen to give you things in terms of, um, sorry, to, uh, to, to give you meals or whatever. They didn't want money in exchange. They wanted your fishing lines. They wanted what other um, things that you'd got on the boat that they would never actually be able to get very easily, clothes or whatever. Um, and uh, that was quite quite different. And some of the scenery um, in the Marquesas and places like that is certainly spectacular, absolutely spectacular. Um, cliffs that would dwarf you and it was just, uh, I say, awe-inspiring, really. Um, I think the other is, um, the sheer, if you've never done it before, the sheer colour of some of the seas that you see. Um, I think in the Caribbean, you've got obviously Tobago Keys and the Grenadines. And when you go there for the first time and you go through the islands and you see the anchorage and you see that colour, you have to pinch yourself and think, is this real? Is it, you see it in the books and things, but it is actually like that. And it's, it, it takes a long time. You just go and stand on the bow and just look at it for ages. Um, Marigot Bay up in St. Martin is a similar sort of thing. Uh, other places, Cocos Keeling in the Indian Ocean is uh, very much like it. And the Society Islands in the Pacific, you've got them like it as well. So um, it is unbelievable when you've never seen it before. Um, I'm, I'm going to move the subject on now as uh, time and tide wait for no man. Um, uh, uh, Roger, I'm going to direct this question at you, um, given your experience as, um, as a training instructor. You have to deal with many and varied people on your boats. Um, what advice would you give people about uh, getting crew to work together or overcoming conflicts on board? What sort of crew advice would you hand out to people? Oh, that's an impossible question to answer, um, really. When you're, I mean, looking for crew, or it's quite difficult because you've got to be compatible. Um, so if you're doing something like the Ark, it's not always possible. Um, but you need to go out, socialise together, just to see if you're on the same wavelength, really. Um, if you've established that, then to just go sailing for, you know, a long weekend, at least you'll see if you can sleep on the same boat and things like that. But actually, it's not too much of a problem unless you have um, big personality conflicts to begin with. Because when you're on passage, you're actually all working together as a team. And you just have to work together. I found most of the conflicts actually occur 
when you get to the other end. Um, as soon as people are allowed to think of what they can do on their own, then all the sort of little cracks appear, and that's the time you need to go to the bar and have another um, beautiful rum or something like that. The choice of crew is critical. Even people that you know well, and you may have grown up with them, may not be good um, companions on an ocean passage. Just because they come from a different background, you may be social in work or for pleasure, but when you actually live in a very, very confined space, it's quite different. But I Bernard, mean, have you got anything to add on that? I know you, you work with challenge business on crew dynamics and things. Do you want to chip in on that subject? Yeah, surely. Um, yeah, I think to add to what has been said, compatibility is important, but it's also about what kind of a culture do you want to um, engender on your particular boat for your particular passage. Um, what I mean by that, um, the, the, the motto on, on my boat throughout our sailing passages was sail safe, sail happy, sail fast, in that order, in all that we do. Now why is that important? If you get a crew person who might be highly competent, who you may get on with ashore, but what they really want to do is to win, to go fast and take risk at night. What they want to do is get that shoot up whenever they can. Question is, is that in keeping with sail safe, sail happy? Probably not. Equally, you might get someone who is there, who just wants to cruise along, do the minimum amount of work, uh, take it easy whenever they can, avoid that sail change, avoid that, um, you know, maintenance routine, and you say, well, hang about, what's that going to do towards our objective? Happy, safe, safe, happy, fast. So it's about what are the crew's expectations when they step onto your boat? They may have very different expectations to you. For example, another example, if you're doing a world circumnavigation, your first leg is quite a short trip. It's called the Atlantic. And what you're thinking about is, I've got another 18 months of this to do. But if your crew person is only doing the Atlantic, then their time frame, their experience is all about what can they do to get the best out of that one passage. And if I can give an example of where that happened to me was, we went from the Galapagos down to the Marquesas, and it was light winds, but it was also quite gusty. And I had a crew person on board whose speed was the essence. It was all about speed, right? And he insisted on putting a lightweight cruising chute up, right, and selling it through the night, which brought one of my rules. I said, look, this is not going to work. Ah, we're gonna, we need some more speed, Bernard. I spent two or three days and nights keeping my fingers crossed I did not rip, you know, uh, my lightweight uh, head sail, cruising chute. He thought it was great fun because he was getting off the boat in Tahiti. He wasn't bothered about what was going to happen for the next two years. So I think in terms of crew selection, make sure they understand what it is that you are trying to achieve, what the boat culture is, and do understand that personalities can get frayed, Claire, no matter how well you know people. Claire, you've got some points on crew, I think. Uh, yes, it was uh, thinking about the audience here, and you're, you're here looking at boats this weekend, uh, so probably it's going to be your home. So you'll be inviting crew into your home, and that actually can be quite difficult, because if you have guests at home, uh, then you tend to do quite a lot for them. You cook for them, you've probably prepared the bed for them, you've done all sorts of things for them. But when they come and sail with you, they've got to actually, well, they, they've got to actually work and pull their weight. So it's, it can be, and I would say often, sadly, particularly if you're female, you've got to manage these people in your home, who are, but you also want them to work at the same time. And I would say that probably of the people who don't enjoy sailing, and there's, they, when they can't get off in St. Lucia, perhaps having done the Atlantic, if they haven't enjoyed it, it's because there's been some crew niggle. It's always, it's crew. Nothing, never to, you can have as many dramas as you like and, and got through them successfully, but if you've not enjoyed it, it's down to crew issues. So it can't be underestimated. And probably the worst is if you've got two couples 
who've known each other for 30 years, 40 years, sail together in their <coughs> sailing clubs, come together to achieve their joint ambition uh, at Ocean, and they had slightly different expectations, as Bernard was saying, and they didn't quite get the rules right, and they fell out probably about who ate the chocolate biscuits. Um, that, I mean, you all know yourself, that if you're in a confined space or something, it's the small thing, it's the way they looked at you uh, that, that causes the problem. So having, and I used to say, it was about managing yourself. The most important thing was making sure that your crew manage yourself. But I'm not so sure now, because consistently I see the crew that are well managed, and that means the skipper stepping up to the plate and actually saying, right, we need, this, we need to manage this situation. Um, having some routines and some r rules and setting the expectation so that yes the person who you know, the, the, the simple things about who's responsible for cleaning the heads every day and make sure that somebody is not somebody it's a named crew or the mother watch do it so that there are kind of rules and responsibilities and expectations and probably expectations because somebody's expect one person's expectations of tidy is probably not somebody else's expectation of tidy um, and that's what that's kind of that's kind of where I would go. It's, 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 it's a tricky subject, um, but thinking about it ahead of time, working out some rules, and, so, and, and working out how you are going to diffuse situa the inevitable situations that arise. Are you going to have um, a happy hour where, where each of you is allowed to, um, what do we call it? Um, gri gripes. Well, on one boat we had a thing called gripes, where at five o'clock every day the crew were asked what their little niggle was. Um, and that was just one way. Or are you going to, if the person standing at the bow, don't uh, don't go close because they're probably just you know, shouting to the wind. Have those rules. Mike, can I can I ask you? Um, I want to bring up the subject of double-handed cruising because a lot of people in the room will be aiming to sail as a couple. What advice would you give people on on a successful cruising life as a couple? I'll just say one mm -hmm. thing on that, just as a quick example. Um, we, and going back to 95, 96, we did an uh, Atlantic circuit and um, uh, we decided that uh, we would have an, uh, one crew member uh, for the long passages because we had our son with us and, and Liz was saying if we, if we had a problem then um, uh, she would want to be looking after Jonathan and having an extra person would give reassurance. It was also the first time we did it. And um, we ended up um, taking a guy who was a, a racer um, and um, who had done lots of racing in the channel and wanted to go, wanted to go fast. Um, and then we did say, uh, he, he, we were thinking of having a tow generator, and, which he didn't like. And we said, well, um, we can have the tow generator and cold beer, or we can have warm beer, which would you prefer? And uh, he decided to go for the cold beer. So we had the tow generator out the, out the back. Um, but we did have this sort of contention that, that he, he wanted to do exactly as you said. Um, when we were coming back, we'd stopped in Bermuda. We didn't have anybody at this point. We were looking for someone, and we picked up a guy who was working on the research station, one of the students, and he told us uh, his, his history in sailing. He'd done all sorts of um, uh, sailing, and we thought, yes, he's, uh, he sounds good. We thought we'd get on with him. So we, we started, and, and after about, well, less than a day, when we were heading off, realised that all his sailing had been on a lake. Um, so he'd, he'd never been offshore. So for the first uh, three days, we doubled up on watches. So um, he, he didn't set a watch on his own. Um, and then he got into doing his own watches. Um, and he was the best crew that we had because he, any issue, he called. Um, you could be 100% certain if there was a problem, he would wake you and, and alert you to it. And that's what we particularly wanted. We wanted give him what he's supposed to do, what we're heading, all the rest of it. But if there was a problem, call me, and he would call me. I wouldn't wake up and find out we've got, as you say, sales up that we shouldn't be having. So, and, and he was a great, great guy, so that, that worked. Um, but in, sorry, in terms of um, double handling... Any top tips for people planning on sailing as a couple? Um, I think you've got to make certain that you get your rest and um, you were saying I overheard at the end about the the days going very very quickly well when there's only two of you on watch um, on the boat then they go very quickly because if you're gonna have seven and a half hours or seven hours sleep each um, then that's 14 hours of the day someone is sleeping 
and you've got handovers, our handovers tended to be never particularly quick, so you've got a half hour between handovers, so you can stick another hour and a half or so onto that. So 15 to 15 and a half hours a day, someone is sleeping. Um, and um, uh, it's, as we found certainly it's important that everybody did get their rest. Um, and if anybody, oh, well, if either of us wanted to, uh, to get extra rest during the day, then um, they'd have extra catch up and, and do some more sleeping during the day. Um, what about things like communication? Did you set aside time to talk to each other or, or just because you're a married couple you were used to talking or maybe not talking? <laughs> <laughs> how, how did that side of it work? Um, no, we didn't have any, any sort of scheduled arrangement to, to talk. Um, we were fairly flexible during the day. Uh, Liz did virtually all the cooking, um, so um, when it was um, breakfast, I would be on watch, etc. During the day, we were reasonably flexible. Um, I used to do all of the um, communication side of things. I used to get all the weather systems as well, um, so Liz would be on watch there. But um, uh, so we were reasonably flexible as far as that was concerned. But at, at night we did go on to a, a firm watch pattern of, um, we started four hours on, um, four hours off, three hours on, three hours off, and that seemed to work quite uh, quite well, and uh, catch up with extra hours during the day if, if you really needed it. Um, I'd like to bring in the other panel on, on the subject of watches, because this is a question we're often asked. Um, Roger, what's your view on, on how to run an ocean watch system? Just, just before that, just going back to the sort of double-handed, Thing. It's great. It's like running a family, isn't it? You've got no other crew to worry about. And you've just got to be able to do everything, you know, each one of you's got its equal partners all the way through. And the point you were making there is sleep. It's absolutely strict. You do this, this and this. And communication, you were very lucky. It's at the end of the trip then you communicate. Because you're working very hard. Um, but no, it's, it's fantastic, and that's the way, to be quite honest, even on a larger vessel, you're running it as a skipper, perhaps with a mate, and the crew are there, but they're rather incidental to what's going on, apart from making your tea, of course. But going on to sort of watch keeping, it depends on the number of people you've got. Um, is, let's, the sort of classic is probably three or four people or something like that, and Generally, I prefer a sort of three hour sort of rolling watch. So you have three hours on, six hours off, um, but that second half of your six hours, you may be on standby. And you keep the same tip um, sort of style. You may say you keep the boat on GMT, you don't actually, but then you don't do the same night hours, night after night after night. And that seems to work quite well with some groups. Um, I was brought up with four hours on, four hours off, and it suits me down to the ground. And then perhaps every so often you split it, so again you change the night hours. The main thing I think is getting into a routine, and the routine is strict. You get people on to watch, on time, when they finish their watch, they go and rest, or they do whatever they want to do. They just don't hang around. Then everybody gets enough rest. I think that's the key thing from my point of view. Does anybody do anything differently? Claire, do you want to comment on watches? I think you think crew issues with me. I, I, I crew. I don't, I don't skip her. I, do, I, I crew and I crew very well. I make tea really well. Um, so so I, the only opinion I have on, 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 on watches is, is I, would, I, would, I would agree with uh, Roger, absolutely. Strict watches um, because then you get to go. Um, I, I, and I like to, to set my alarm so I get up on time. I don't rely on anybody else to wake me up because if it's really exciting, then they don't. Um, make some rules about whether you get up uh, early for your watch um, and whether you're going to make the person, uh, if you're coming on watch, do you take the tea with you or do you make the tea for the person who is coming on watch? Um, but I would, I would su suggest um, it's whatever works for you. I've met, um, I've met some double handers and they did uh, 12 hours on, 12 hours off. I think that only works if you're in somewhere warm. They've said, you know, during the day normally you don't go to bed every three hours. Why would you do it at sea? It was somewhere warm and nice and peaceful and they had kids so they did it midnight to midday. Wouldn't work for me necessarily. I would say most people do shorter at night and longer during the day and I would suggest that 
whatever watch pattern you have, if you can allow everybody a period where they get a decent amount of sleep every day, then you'll have happy crew. You know, if you're well rested and you eat well, then you're basically going to be a pretty happy crew. Um, I want to move the subject on. Um, money is often something we're asked about, particularly budgets. <laughs> I'm going to ask Bernard this one. Um, people want to know what's it going to cost to sail around the world. How much money do I need to have? How much money am I going to spend? How would you answer that question? With difficulty. Um, could I put a different way of, of answering this question? If I was to ask anyone here, um, if you want to sail around the world, you will not do it in less than about two years, 18 months, two years. How much do you need to spend staying at home, keeping your boat in the marina for two years? Would anyone like to shout any figures out? So you've got a two year period, you keep a boat in the Solent, how much do you think you will spend in two years? How many? 20,000. 20,000? 30,000? Well, your berthing fees will start off probably at about, on, a, on the kind of boat that will cost, cross an ocean, you're probably talking about four, five, six, seven thousand pounds a year to park your boat. <laughs> then you've got all that you spend on food, all that you spend on drink, all that you spend on entertainment and you can add that up, and it's probably not less than about £25,000 a year, probably. A budget to go around the world, I would say in two years, is about £50,000. Depends on lots of other things as well, but a ballpark figure is about £25,000 a year. And that includes, in my case, flying my wife out to many, many exotic places <laughs> and flying back. And also spending time on the boat, you know, for some of the nicer passages up through Malaysia and up to Thailand and Singapore and all those parts. So the question is, um, depends on your lifestyle. I have friends who have done similar uh, also passages I have done. And the minute they arrive anywhere, they hire cars, they stay in hotels, they go on tours, uh, they catch a flight to go and see some volcano or something. And of course their budget will be double mine. So I think the answer is not as much as you think when you compare it with not doing ocean sailing or long passages. But a ballpark figure for me, if someone to ask me what would I budget for to do a two year ocean passage, it took me two years and three months in the end, but uh, it's about 50,000 pounds, including all kinds of costs like you know, flights and all that kind of stuff. Which I think is a good deal, because two and a half years of spending on drink and food and entertainment is, is not a lot. Mike, did you, um, did you get caught out on your cruising budget with, with big ticket items you weren't expecting to pay for, or did you kind of smooth the way with an average so some places were more expensive and you kind of went cheaper in the next place? How did you kind of manage the flow of funds? Yeah, I don't think we had any really major big things, did we? Um, and I must admit, um, what we spent was a lot less than you said, because uh, on a six year that would make it, um, what's 150,000? Um, you weren't flying your wife out, that helped. <laughs> <No, laughs> you took her with you. <laughs> yes. Um, so, no, it was a, a, a lot cheaper than that. Um, uh, but we weren't extravagant in terms of what we did. We did uh, we did go places when we got in. We used to hire cars, um, not too too much of a problem when we went places. Um, New Zealand, we even took a helicopter around Mount Cook and all that sort of thing. But we didn't do it uh, a huge amount. Um, and uh, I suppose the, the big items that we did, the big spending items, were things for the boat that um, that we did um, in New Zealand? We decided we wanted to add things to it. In Trinidad, we decided we wanted to add things to it. Um, uh, in um, New Zealand, we had quite a quite a, a, a number of items. We wanted to put a new chart plotter on. We wanted extra solar panels um, and things like that. So that's where the bigger money went. Um, uh, but there was nothing 
major that um, caused us to suddenly think, crikey, where are we going to get that from? W would it be fair to say you were, you were living on a similar amount of money before you went sailing to the amount you spent when you were sailing? I think in terms of actual living, um, as opposed to the boat, put that money to side, it was cheaper to be on the boat than it was not to be on the boat, uh, definitely. Interesting, thank you. Um, I'm going to... Sorry, it was a question, sorry. So the question is, any comments about sailing around the world with pets? I haven't, I'll pass it on. But I will just say that it's come up a couple of times about the fact that, um, about being a home. And I think that is absolutely key because um, uh, when you've got a boat in this country, it's a boat. You go down there, you go sailing, and you come back and you go to your house. Now imagine actually sailing your house around the world and how you do things differently because of all the things and precious things that you've got in there that you want to maintain um, and uh, the way you treat it and the way you expect other people to treat it. It's your home and when you're doing it for six years it becomes very precious to you. I haven't actually sailed with pets but I've met quite a lot of people fortunately through, through World Cruising and World Ark um, and the uh, general tip would be don't do it, it's very expensive. Um, uh, there was on the first world arc there was a cat that was or a kitten a beautiful kitten that went on a beautiful yacht called grey lady and by the time they got to australia they had spent a fortune on moving this cat and generally having it uh, following all the rules and regulations and when they got to australia the australians were not impressed and it had to stay on a boat in the middle of the river in a cage um, otherwise they were going to take it off them and it would stay in quarantine until they uh, left again. Um, it's really not a good idea if you're thinking of sailing around the world to take a pet. Um, it, it, yeah, you'd really come to regret it. In some places it's not allowed off the boat. Um, many places it's not allowed off the boat and you'll spend a lot of time waiting for the vet to arrive to get it cleared in and cleared out and all the rest of it. So it's not as, uh, an easy, easy, easy thing to do. It's probably fair to say it's easier in the Caribbean than it is in the Pacific. They're a bit more geared up to it. Yeah, it's, it's more if the pet, if you were going around the world. Mm. So if you're going to go around the world and expect your pet to still be with you at the other end, um, if uh, it, yeah, in the Caribbean it would be easier. In the Pacific, yeah, it's going to be on the boat more often mm. than not because you're going to be dinghying ashore a lot more. Um, a word of advice: uh, if you want to check out individual countries on your itinerary, if you go to noonsite.com. There's a lot of information there about up-to-date guidance on each country because the rules vary from country to country. They'll tell you what the quarantine requirements are. Australia is the big problem. It really is. They're not keen on letting anything in that didn't originate in Australia. And for a good reason. You know, ecosystem to look after. Um, there so what no, 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 uh, and, and uh, Australian, Australian, Australian quarantine clearance for, for the food and drink you have on board your boat, you'll end up putting most of it in a big bin, uh, which they will incinerate and charge you for the privilege of taking away from you. So eat everything before you get to Australia, but not your pets. Um, I, we're almost out of time. Sorry, question there. Yep. So the question for our panel is, what's the thing you wished you'd known before you set off, having done it, with hindsight, what do you wish you'd known before you set off? Oh, you've stumped them. Well done, you get a prize for that. Oh, well, if I, I've got the mic, so if I may, I'll kick off. I wish I'd known that it was nothing like as difficult as I thought. Um, when I You mean you thought it was more difficult than it yes, was? Yeah. Yes, in other words... You know, to me, Biscay is frightening. When you've done it, what's the problem? Yeah. To get into the Canary Isles is a big challenge. When you've done it, oh, the Atlantic, and so it goes on. So the thing I, w I wish I'd known was, why didn't I plan to do it earlier? And why didn't I plan to do it longer? I wish I'd known that. So, uh, Lou, you were waving frantically. Yeah. What
good, good point. Yeah, you will have lots of tropical sundowners sitting under your awning watching the rain squalls. Another question there. That Yeah, the, the question is, um, any tips about personal safety and security in some of these far-flung places in the Caribbean and beyond? Who would like to comment on that? Very briefly, don't worry about it. I leave the keys in my car. <laughs> it's a, again, it's a matter of attitude. Just use common sense. Some areas you will have to lock it. Some areas you'll have to hire a reminder. You just have to you know, talk to the other people visiting. It is not as much of a problem as you would think in most places. You're more likely to have your car vandalised in Livington than perhaps most places. Uh, uh, a couple of things. Um, one thing, I find it strange that some um, people in this country, I would think, how, how many people here go to bed at night and don't lock your front door? <laughs> not, not many. Um, yet you go to a, a country where um, the uh, majority of the population are incredibly poor um, and yet you leave all your hatches and um, uh, you wonder why that there's a problem. Um, so, I mean, we've always adopted that what we wouldn't do in this country, we wouldn't do ashore. So we used to close the hatch at night and we used to lock it. So we were locked inside wherever we went because that's what we do at home. Um, and yes, we tried to make sure we had plenty of ventilation elsewhere, things that weren't going to be an issue. Um, so, but, but that's the attitude that we certainly certainly took to it. Uh, the other thing I would have said that the, uh, the Caribbean, when we were in the Caribbean, you did, uh, people who've been there more recently, I mean we were there in 2014, but it was very much a lock it or lose it um, area. Um, and when we went through Panama, people said, you, you won't need to lock anything, and we weren't sure we believed them. But when we did go through Panama, and we got through past Panama City, um, I don't think we ever locked the dinghy um, right the way until we got to New Zealand. And we never were concerned on any of the islands um, of any problems. It was just so different um, situation. Um, so that's just a, an obs observation. I think I'd add to that as well, that, that stress the importance of talking to other people when you arrive somewhere. Cruisers are great at networking, they will share information. If there's a problem somewhere, word gets around quite quickly. Um, so talk to other people if you're going into somewhere new. And then a lot of people worry about theft on board their boat when the real issue is petty street crime when you go ashore. Um, so again, be sensible uh, with watches and displaying cash and valuables. and you wouldn't necessarily walk down the wrong parts of London at 11 o'clock at night having had a skin full of rum um, and be surprised if you get mugged. That's the situation. People, you, you kind of have to wake up to where you are um, and be a little bit sensible about your behaviour. Um, and then most people have a very happy time cruising, I think we'd say. Yeah. And there are places you'd avoid, but you'll hear that on the, on, on, on the grapevine. Um, on that subject, um, we're sort of out of time, so I'd like to uh, just... Before we go, any top tips or favourite places or sagacious words you want to leave our audience with before we finish? It might be your favourite place to go, your reason to go cruising. Or... I think lots of favourite places. It's very, very difficult. Um, I think I mentioned New Zealand uh, earlier. Um, the other is um, the, the Gal Galapagos. Um, our, uh, we got a cruising permit before we went there and um, so we were able to stay there seven weeks which were uh, and go to three different islands um, uh, and um, actually seven weeks we were there for two weeks longer than Charles Darwin um, so um, uh, a fantastic place. Fantastic. Roger any final words from you about reasons to go sailing maybe or? Just do it. <laughs> nice and brief thank you. That's it. <laughs> Bernard something brief from you. Yeah well I think uh, Roger that's absolutely right. Uh, my message to anybody would be um, plan it, fix a date for doing it, and work towards that. Don't be overly concerned with all the things that can go wrong, or with safety, or with having got the required training. Set the date, put it in the diary, plan towards it. Or as, uh, as, as swimmers would say, pull yourself towards the finish. 
don't keep putting off the start until you've got enough knowledge, information, training, experience. If you set the date, whether it be Rally Portugal, whether it be the Ark, whether it be the World Light, whatever it might be, fix the date and go towards it. Claire, any last words? I was trying to think of something short and sweet, but actually I'm going to steal from somebody else. Um, it's uh, Jürgen and Louise on a boat called uh, Takeoff. Uh, they're cruising with their kids. They're currently in the Pacific. They did start in Scandinavia somewhere, um, but it was Jürgen who said, we get involved. And he does really get involved. But they, it, so I don't think it matters where you go or what you do or how you do it, but get involved is a really good good thought. Whether that's uh, applied to your cr to crew getting stuck into everything on the boat because much as Jem says it can't be boring, I have actually been on a plane back from St Lucia where somebody said, oh, sailing is so boring, but he hadn't been allowed to get involved. So if everybody can get involved in everything, they will find the sailing fantastically interesting. But when you go ashore, Actually, it is more than the sailing. It's about the people who are there and the experiences you have. And yeah, get stuck in, get involved. That's what I would say. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all our panel, uh, Claire, Bernard, Roger, Mike, for your contributions.